السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته رمضان كريم وكل سنة وحضراتكم طيبين وبخير وبصحة وسعادة مع حضراتكم محمد بديوي ولينا محمد أدوية براند مانجرز والمسؤولين عن الأورتوبادك بورتفوليو شركة أدوية 36 سنة من الخبرة والنجاح كأحد شركات الدواء الوطنية الرائدة في مصر من سنة 1984 من المعروف عن شركة أدوية تميزها بتقديم جودة استثنائية لأدويتها وفي نفس الوقت تكلفة بتحترم القدرة المادية للمريض المصري في الظروف المختلفة اللي بيمر بيها شركة أدوية بتقدم من خلال مصانعها في العاشر من رمضان ومدينة العبور عدد كبير من البرانس اللي تقريبا بتغطي معظم الثيرابيوتيك ارياز المختلفة وبتصدرها لكتير من دول الشرق الأوسط وأفريقيا وده طبعا نتيجة تميز الجودة بتاعتها أدوية بتقدم لحضراتكم ريتش أورثوبيديك بورتفوليو بداية طبعا من الأدويتين كبسولة نيوروباثيك بين أزا دالكستين 30 ميلي جرام و 60 ميلي جرام وطبعا الأنتي كوكس ميلوكسيكام 15 ميلي جرام بكل الفورمز بتاعته المختلفة سواء كانت الأمبول أو التابلت السابوزيتري وكمان الكبسول وطبعا عيلة الأدوية فلام اللي بتقدم حلول للبين لكل أفراد العيلة في كل الفورمز بتاعتها المختلفة المتوفرة الأمبول فورم الإيميل جل السابوزيتري الكبار والأطفال الكبسول وكمان الساشت بالإضافة طبعا للأدوية موف والأوسيونيت وكتير من الأدوية المنتظرة من البايبلاينز وفي وسط الظروف الصعبة اللي العالم كله بيمر بيه بسبب وباء كورونا كان في واجب على شركة أدوية تجاه المجال الطبي في مصر وكمان تجاه المجتمع علشان كده أدوية في الأيام اللي فاتت قدمت كميات كبيرة من أدوات الحماية والتعقيم لأكتر من 80 مستشفى حكومية وعامة في كل محافظات مصر مش بس كده ده كمان أدوية عملت بيج على الفيسبوك باسم دكتورك في بيتك لتقديم الاستشارات الطبية المجانية في مختلف التخصصات لكل الم المرضى اللي مش قادرين يتواصلوا مع العيادات والمستشفيات خلال وقت الحصر عشرات من اللايف فيديوز قدمها باقة من أطباء مصر في كل التخصصات ولسه مكملين أما على المستوى الطبي والعلمي شركة أدوية اهتمت بالتعاون مع الجمعية المصرية لجراحة العظام لتقديم طريقتين مختلفتين من اللقاءات العلمية الطريقة الأولانية من خلال تقديم محاضرات علمية مسجلة على جروب الجمعية على فيسبوك وكمان على يوتيوب أما بقى الطريقة الثانية والمهمة جدا واللي احنا بنقدمها لحضراتكم النهاردة هي الويبينار والبث المباشر على الهوى لمناقشة موضوع علمي ودسكشن مهم جدا ما بين الهاي تي بي الأوستيوتومي and اليوني كومبارتمنتال ني أرثروبلاستي وطبعا هيقدمهم اثنين من الأغنياء عن التعريف الأستاذ الدكتور جمال حسني رئيس الجمعية المصرية لجراحة العظام والأستاذ الدكتور محمود حافظ أستاذ ورئيس قسم جراحة العظام كلية الطب جامعة 6 أكتوبر أدوية بتتمنى لحضراتكم الاستمتاع بالوجبة العلمية الدسمة ديت شكرا وشكرا جزيلا لحضراتكم First of all I would like to thank uh, أدوية company for supporting uh, this symposium Uh, we, uh, I'm going to present uh, this symposium with uh, my friend, the Professor Mahmoud Hafiz, a professor of orthopedic surgery, uh, October University. And in spite of being close friends, we are going to have a crossfire discussion in such a meeting. We are going to present two opposite uh, principles or ideas. I'm going to speak about the um, osteotomy. Which patient needs the osteotomy? when, what kind, and the results. Um, in some presentations, you get valid conclusion and the end. But this is not the aim of this presentation. The aim of my presentation is to raise more questions. I need you to think. I need you to decide for yourself. I need you to decide for the patient. What's better? What's best? What's the best for the patient? So I need is I'm going to raise more questions. I'm not going to give you real conclusions. 
And this is an example of contradiction. 34 years old, male, painful lymph, lymph, left knee since three years. He had arthroscopic debridement and partial meniscectomy 15 months ago. The job is construction labor worker, hard manual labor, jo smoker. And this is a weight-bearing view of the knee. Look to the left side. We have almost unicompartmental medial osteoarthritis with ligamentous laxity. As you see, the joint is open on the lateral side. What are you going to, th to do? Think about it. At the end, I'm going to present it to think about the possibilities in this young age. We have two options, the high tibial osteotomy and unicompartmental arthroplasty. Which one is better for the patient? Which one is the best for the patient? With the advent and subsequent success of knee arthroplasty surgery, especially in low demand and older patients, there has been a relative neglect of osteotomy as a valid treatment modality in many healthcare services. في تراجع كبير جدا في الاهتمام بالاستيوتومي in such cases. We don't know why, because of the development of unicompartmental arthroplasty with high success results. So, what's going on now? There is a developing consensus called arthroplasty first. It looks like America first. So when you have a patient with unicompartmental osteoarthritis, people think about arthroplasty first. This is not an exaggeration. This is reality that now the surgeons they think more about arthroplasty when they are dealing with such patients. And in this paper, you see, which had been published 19, 2019, High tibial osteotomy is an alternative procedure for knee arthroplasty. It's exactly what I present, arthroplasty first. Even in young active patient with malaligned knee with uh, induced medial compartment degeneration. This is the ideal patient for high tibial osteotomy. But you see in this paper, they say arthroplasty first. So we have two choices, but can we discuss a third choice? Can we discuss a conservative treatment? Why not? Why the people stick to two options? Perhaps we have more options. We have more conservative treatment in such cases. The malalignment and osteoarthritis. A neutral alignment, the knee moment in the coronal plane causes approximately 55 to 70 percent of the knee load to be transmitted on the medial compartment during the stance phase of gait. With various alignment, this imbalance is, exaggerate, is exacerbated so that a deviation of one millimeter varus from neutral alignment increases the medial load by 5 percent. So we increase load on the, right, on the medial side. In a longitudinal observational study, the various alignment of more than two degrees considerably increased the probability of developing osteoarthritis in a rather short period of time. Not only this, there is an effect of the mechanical varus on the anterior crochet and lateral collateral ligament stress. So even mild mechanical varus negatively affects the anterior crochet ligament and lateral collateral ligament. The decrease in the displaced compartment of the tibial plateau reduces the knee joint pain and delays progression of osteoarthritis. This is the real value of high tibial osteotomy. Why we do osteotomy? We do osteotomy to correct the malalignment. So if you have a malalignment of the lower femur, we do osteotomy and to correct the malalignment. So this is an alignment surgery. This is correction of malalignment surgery. What about the malalignment? To correct the malalignment, you have to know, to correct the malalignment, you have to know the truth of the malalignment. What about the varus knee? What about the valgus knee? Where the deformity, where does the deformity lie? Where? Where is it? Where is the core? Where is the apex of the deformity? You know, we've learned before that uh, 
Varus knee is due to tibial deformity and valgus knee is due to femoral deformity. So if you have varus knee, you have to correct from the tibia. If you have valgus knee, you have to correct it from the femur. Is the myth or basic or basics? Actually, it's a myth. It's a myth. It's not true. This is not true by any means. If you have a, a problem, if you have valgus or varus knee, if you have deformity of the knee, the deformity can lie in the femur, in the tibia, or both of them, and you can have ligamentous laxity. You see such patient presented in such a case. This patient had valgus knee and had been treated by femoral osteotomy. But if you look closely, if you look closely, you find the deformity is 100% tibial. So we corrected the tibial deformity. So it is just a myth. How we choose the osteotomy site? You have to be open. It can be the femoral, it can be tibial or both, or ligamentous laxity. We do the malalignment test. The malalignment test, we send, we project the line from the center of the head of the femur to the center of the ankle. This line has to pass through the center of the, almost the center of the knee. If it passes medially, that means you have a varus deformity. If it passes laterally, that means you have a lateral, you have a valgus deformity. And I have to analyze the um, axis, the femoral axis and the tibial axis. And this is an example of the malalignment test. This is the normal knee and this is varus knee and valgus knee. Again, with the long-standing film, you have to see the joint conversions to find out the ligamentous laxity. It's very important to find out the ligamentous laxity because correction of the deformity will not correct the ligamentous laxity. There are certain measures to deal with the ligamentous laxity. Another problem. We always do long-standing film in the AP and lateral. Why? Look to this patient. The patient has a various deformity. But there is also pro-recurvatum, pro pro-recurvatum flexion of the upper femur. So you have to think three-dimensional. We always think about uh, the coronal plane and sagittal plane. This is not true. If you think about the deformity, you have 30, 30, 360 degrees. The coronal plane is just one degree or two degrees. This is the coronal plane. The sagittal plane is the vertical two degrees. So what about the other degrees? Mostly the deformity, it's not purely coronal or sagittal. The deformity usually in the oblique plane. That's why you see the deformity in the EP and lateral. And people call this deformity sometimes biplanar deformity. It's not biplane. It's uniplane deformity. But it's not in the coronal or the sagittal. It's in between. Something else which is very important, the rotational malalignment. The people ignore the rotational malalignment. Perhaps you have a varus knee, but you have internal rotation or you have external rotation. And if you do osteotomy, you can correct the rotation acutely or gradually. So in some cases, during evaluation of the patient, you have to evaluate the rotational malalignment. In such a case, we measure the angle of antiversion. We draw the axis of the femoral head and neck and the axis passing through the femoral condyles, the posterior part of the femoral condyles. And this is for the femur. For the tibia, again, we, measure, we, uh, we have the axis of the lower tibial plateau and another axis of the two uh, maluli, medial lateral maluli. And we superimpose them to know the rotation of the lower tibia. So again, you have to analyze the rotational malalignment. If you do osteotomy, you are able to correct all the deformity. You are able to correct the rotational deformity. You are able to correct the uh, flexion deformity, recurvative deformity, uh, varus, valgus, whatever. And in many cases, in my experience, after having hundreds of cases of osteotomies, it's not almost always, it's not always, it's not almost always uh, isolated um, varus or valgus deformity. What about the osteotomy site? In many cases of varus um, knee, the deformity is high up. It's almost intraarticular, just juxtaarticular. So it's almost impossible to do the osteotomy at the 
apex of the deformity. So we do the osteotomy lower down than the apex of the deformity. When we do the osteotomy, not exactly at the site of the cora, we have to do some displacement to correct the mechanical axis. Otherwise, you correct the deformity by creating another deformity and it's going to be zigzag-like or something like. So in many cases, in most of the cases of various knee, you need to do your osteotomy just below the apex of the deformity. And in such a case, you have to do some displacement. And I will give you an example how to displace. Look to this picture. This picture has a se severe various deformity, as you see. And we did high tibial osteotomy. Usually we do the osteotomy, in my experience, below the tibial tubercle. So it's not exactly at the site of the deformity. <coughs> so we have to do some displacement. In such a case, you see, there is medial displacement of the proximal fragment. There is medial displacement of the proximal fragment. And you see the mechanical axis from the center of the hip to the center of the knee. It lies far medial, far from the um, center of the knee. Again, the malalignment test on the left side, the, from the center to the center, is far from the center of the knee. And look, during the follow-up, the follow-up after eight years of the osteotomy, displacement and correction, you see the, from the center of the medial, from the center of the hip to the center of the knee, it passes almost through the center of the knee. And on the left side, it passes through the center of the knee. This is how we correct the deformity. And in such cases, we have to do translation. Look to this picture, look to the arrow, the yellow arrow. And you see, we did medial displacement. Why we do medial displacement? To keep the mechanical axis. So we do osteotomy and translation. So in many cases, we do osteotomy and translation to keep the mechanical axis perfect. Overcorrection is one of the principle, principles of um, high tibial osteotomy. Multiple recommendations for postoperative valgus anatomic, which is very variable between the authors. Some authors consider between 5 to 13, 7 to 13. Usually we make overcorrection about 6 to 7 degrees, not more than 8 degrees. Most common reason for failure of osteotomy is undercorrection. You have to know this. Undercorrection is the most common cause of failure of high tibial osteotomy. But take care. Overcorrection need, needed to obtain long-term clinical results, but may increase the joint obliquity. If you increase it more than this, perhaps you are going to increase the joint obliquity. We have to assess the patient. This is normal. You have to assess the patient clinically, geographically. So if the patient has pain, the gait, ligamentous instability, the thrust during walking, the range of motion, you should have a, a fair range of motion. Don't talk about osteotomy if you have a stiff, stiff knee. Radiological, we need to have long-standing film, AP and lateral, long-standing film. This is crucial thing because sometimes you have secondary deformities. What does it mean? If you have a deformity, a blown disease or something, and the patient have a long, long-standing deformity and started to develop osteoarthritis of the medial uh, part of the joint, perhaps you are going to have a, a, a compensatory valgus deformity of the lower femur. And there is a rule. If you have a fixed secondary deformity and you are going to correct the primary deformity, you have to correct the secondary deformity too. So if you are going to correct in such long-standing cases the various deformity of the upper femur, you have to correct the valgus deformity of the lower femur at the same time. Rotational profile. You have to examine the patient closely. Many patients they complain with high tibial osteotomy of internal tibial torsion, internal tibial torsion. You can correct that very simply during the osteotomy. You can do this clinically if you look to the patella and look to the foot. Usually the foot is externally rotated between 12 to 20 degrees. If it is internally rotated or externally rotated, you measure it and you can make the rotational profile. It's very important to do by CT the rotational profile. What's the rotational profile for the tibia? You superimpose two lines. The first line um, is passing through the posterior part of the medial of the upper part of the tibial plateau of the upper tibial condyles and the second line passes through the medial and lateral malleoli passes through both of them when you superimpose them you can know the rotational of the uh, lower part of the tibia
And this is one of the patients which had the uh, procedure. You see, we should do uh, long standing film of the uh, lower limb, both, knee, both, both sides, and long standing film lateral. It's very important. In many cases, you have mild flexion deformity and you have to correct it. And sometimes you have recurvatum deformity and you can correct it too. Which patient is valid for the high tibial osteotomy? Proper selection of patients for high tibial osteotomy is compulsory to attain satisfactory results. I don't know because everything, this is a common phrase, so you can, you can put it, this phrase for anything on earth. You can put it on arthroplasty, you can put it in conservative treatment. I don't know, this is the conclusion written on most of the paper. For me, it's just hypothetical talk. Which patient? Unicompartmental osteoarthritis. So the people insist it has to be unicompartmental. Okay. How many, what's the percentage of unicompartmental osteoarthritis in osteoarthritis patients? Isolated medial compartment osteoarthritis occurs in 10 to 29.5% of all cases. It's, it's a high instance. It's not a small number of cases. So the problem is significant. Whereas the isolated lateral variant is, is less common with a reported instance of 1 to 7%. So uh, osteoarthritis of the lateral compartment is far less than the medial compartment. So the ideal patient is a patient with a malalignment with unicompartmental osteoarthritis. Okay, we all agreed, but which degree of osteoarthritis? There are classifications. I'm not going to project the classifications. They say if you have a mild or moderate, but if you have a severe, don't do osteoarthritis. So look to this patient. This patient with genoverum, as you see, and they have medial osteoarthritis. What about the lateral side? No osteoarthritis. Are you sure that the lateral compartment has no osteoarthritis? How do you diagnose osteoarthritis? Usually we diagnose osteoarthritis with a plain x-ray. Okay? But we have other modalities now. We have MRI, ultrasonography. We have biomarkers, compositional MRI. So I think many of the cases which we think it's unicompartmental osteoarthritis, actually we have osteoarthritic changes in the other compartments. Uh, in the other compartments. So talking about pure osteoarthritis, uh, osteoarthritis purely in the medial compartment, again for me, it's a hypothetical situation. Because there is no guarantee, especially we usually do as a routine only plain x-rays or just routine MRI, not compositional MRI, which detects very, very early osteoarthritis. Again, which patient needs osteotomy? Active patients, high level of activity, less than 60 years. But if you look to the um, literature in Japan, they make it 70 years, not 60. So if the patient is 68 or 70 years and is highly active, why not to do high tibial osteotomy? By the way, they claim very good results in, the Japan, in Japan. And in the, also in Asia, they claim very good results in such patients. Unicompartmental knee pain. At least 90 degrees of flexion. Yeah, you, have, you should have fair range of motion. What about ligamentous laxity? People put the ligamentous laxity as a, as a rule. It, you don't have to see lateral thrust, but this is questionable because you can deal with the ligamentous laxity. Wait, if the patient is overweight, but you see this patient, this patient is overweight. But if you fix it with external fixator, there is no problem at all. The patient can do it bearing the next day, so we don't have a problem at all. High tibial osteotomy for re instability is a questionable situation. An important consideration is performing a high tibial osteotomy for treatment of malalignment and ligament instability is the ability to simultaneously correct both coronal and sagittal axis malalignment with one cut. They call it biplane. We don't call it biplane. It's oblique plane. When? Again, in the papers, earlier the better. It's hypothetical again. There's no proof. To prove that if you do it early, better than late, 
or early results uh, are uh, or if you have um, an early ulcer arthritis you can have better results than late diagnosis or something again it's hypothetical i'm going to question everything in this lecture because many of the talks about the topic they are mainly hypothetical people they follow each other they don't have a proof which patient needs osteotomy again the best long-term survival grades are achieved in high table osteotomy with mild compartment osteoarthritis good paper but how he judged the osteoarthritis by plain x-rays plain x-rays cannot tell you that the other compartment has no osteoarthritis there are many new methods but they are damn expensive you cannot do it for each patient Radiographic evidence of severe preoperative compartment degeneration has been associated with early conversion to tutani. Again, there is no proof. This is in this paper. See the, um, you have to see the uh, selection criteria. You have to see the, uh, the, the number of patients, you know this. Coming back to my patients with the contradiction, 34 years old male. Painful left knee in three years. Arthroscopic debridement and partial meniscectomy 15 months ago. And your job, very heavy. Very difficult job. <clears throat> Again, this is the x-ray. Showing that uh, osteoarthritic changes on the medial side. Severe changes. Lipping. As you see, the joint is almost closed. And severe pain. And this is the way the patient walking, you see. If you look to the, the way the patient walks, there is lateral thrust. It looks like the joint sublaxes it during walking, just normal walking. You see the lateral thrust of the patient while walking due to the ligamentous laxity. We did long standing film. We have to measure our angles. We have to see that there is no compensatory deformity. We see the rotation. We do everything before doing the operation. Again, we had evident ligamentous laxity. The lateral compartment, as you see, it opens. And severe osteoarthritis. What we did in this case, we did high tibial osteotomy below the tibial tubercle and corrected the deformity. And we removed the segment about three centimeters from the fibula. And we fixed the fibula alone in a half ring then we did gradual descent of the fibula, one millimeter per day, just to tighten the lateral ligament. We tightened the lateral ligament, which is quite lax. Again, we did the distal distraction of the fibula, one millimeter per day. As you see, this is the fibula, you see the gap. The gap is decreasing, the gap is getting smaller. Again, smaller, till we close the gap. While we close the gap, the head of the fibula, we pull the head of the fibula down. And we allow the patient to do weight bearing. Because clinically it's very important. If the patient has to, uh, while doing weight bearing, we see that there is no lateral thrust. The knee is tight. You see, this is weight bearing view. And with the weight bearing view, again, long standing weight bearing view, the joint did not open as we see before the operation. Again, we do long-standing film lateral because of the tibial slope. It's very important to follow up the tibial slope. In this case, you see there is a flexion of the tibial slope. This is not normal. So we have to correct the tibial slope. We put a distractor posteriorly and we corrected the tibial slope one millimeter per day. And this is the real merit of gradual treatment. This is the real merit of gradual osteotomy. You can change your mind one and a half months after the operation. You can deal with all types of the deformities. You can increase the tight you can increase the tightness of the ligament according to the way the patient walks. You see now the tibial slope after at the end of the operation. It's perfect tibial slope. At the same patient, while the patient standing on one leg, it's very important to stand on one leg also, 
while the frame on is on to be sure that there is no ligamentous laxity. You see EP, AP and lateral and this is before the operation, look to the lateral thrust of the patient, clear lateral thrust and during the, uh, the after two months of the gradual descent of the fibula, you see full correction and there is no thrust at all, the knee is tight, see the patient, full with bearing without crutches. You see now after removal with the follow-up, the same patient He returned back to his function, his normal job again. Again, this is before and after. I want to you compare the results. The pain disappeared. And what I want to say, if there is any problem in the future, the possibility of arthroplasty is still there. But if you offer this young guy a normal knee, if you offer him or a quite normal knee, you see the patient stands on one leg to see the stability. If you can offer him a normal knee, I think it's far better than giving him uh, artificial joints. What procedure is the best? Many procedures and fixation devices to perform. But it's important to have a precise alignment correction, a rigid fixation, and ease of the possibility of total knee. Don't close this file. So don't do something which makes things difficult for the surgeon if he wants to do arthroplasty later on. We have many combinations for osteotomies. We have closed wedge, doom shaped, hemi closed, open wedge, many fixation devices, external fixator, blade plates, plates and screws. What kind? Although modern implants and surgical techniques are being used, evidence supporting use of one method of high tubal osteotomy over another is lacking. People, each one is dogmatic. One said that high tubal osteotomy, no doom shaped. For me, gradual osteotomy and using uh, Lazaro external fixator is better. But there is no evidence to support that there is one method is far better than the other. The principles, the level of osteotomy, again, even the principles, the difference. People believe that it's above the tubercle, which is more common because you have high healing rates, but limited range of correction below the tubercle, which we prefer. Greater range of motion, more bone proximity for fixation, more bone to fix lower healing rates. But if you have an external fixator, there is no problem at all. Internal or external fixation, it depends upon your experience. But in some cases, especially the very fat people, External fixator or circular fixator has a merit. The patient can walk the day after, especially if he's young or even very old, because both of them, we don't want the patient to stay for fear of DVT or any other problem. Surgical accuracy of the osteotomy for the correction, the people sometimes suggested computer assisted osteotomy. It's okay if you'd like to use the computer assisted osteotomies. The long term outcome of high TBL osteotomy. I'm not going to speak about it because we have two schools in Japan and the East. They have very good, very high or a very high instance of good results with high tibial osteotomy, even at the age of 70 years. If you look to the American and English literature, the instance or the success rate of the long term is something like 60 percent, 50, 60 percent. We don't know what's the difference between the uh, North America and Europe and Japan and the East. Why those people have the best, far better results than the people in the North America. In Japan, they tend to preserve the original joints and have therefore performed high tibial osteotomy in more severely arthritic knees with a deteriorating range of motion, even with a deteriorating range of motion. They, you know, they broaden the indication in Japan. These cases then needed conversion to tutani at between 10 and 10 years after high tibial osteotomy, even if they deserve to have high tibial osteotomy afterwards.
Total knee displacement, uh, replacement after high tibial osteotomy, all data published fail to demonstrate statistically significant differences between the patients treated with primary total knee or the total knee following a high tibial osteotomy. People claim that if you do high tibial osteotomy, there will be a problem with the total knee. This is not true. In the papers, there is no true. There is no difference. In the follow-up between the patient having primary total knee for the same indication, the people who had total knee after failure of high tibial osteotomy. So why not? Why to start with high tibial osteotomy? Another topic, you have to read it. High tibial osteotomy and other procedures. You can augment the high tibial osteotomy with other procedures. You can do stem cells. PRB, you can do abrasion arthroplasty with high tibial osteotomy. There are papers and they claim fun good functional results. You see this paper published in uh, 2019. The injection, intra injection of mesenchymal cell with high tibial osteotomy for treatment of osteoarthritis. And it gives good results, good functional results. So high tibial osteotomy allows you to give other option to the patient. You can use uh, the, all weapons you have in your armamentarium with high tibial osteotomy to have elastic joint. You can use mesenchymal cells. So you can add high tibial osteotomy to the newly biological solutions. You know, the revolution now is the uh, biological treatment of osteoarthritis. This is the real merit. This is the real revolution. When you do biologic treatment, so if you have a problem with osteoarthritis and you correct the malalignment of osteotomy, you can use this breakthrough, new treatments, to have a lasting normal knee. In conclusion, in cases with unicompartmental osteoarthritis, there is no evidence to support the policy, policy of arthroplasty uh, first. There is no more arthroplasty first. No conclusion can be drawn on which technique is to be preferred and the choice remains a matter of preference of the surgeon until further studies become available. High tibial osteotomy has acceptable long-term clinical and functional results that could not be underestimated by orthopedic surgeon under pressure to perform arthroplasty operation. So there is no more arthroplasty first option. It is osteotomy first option. Osteotomy first option. Osteotomy first option. Thank you. First, I would like to thank um, Adwia and also uh, thank uh, Prof. Gamal for uh, being with us today in uh, this webinar. Uh, he's, uh, he's the one who invited me and um, I hope that we're not going to end by a fight during the discussion. Uh, this is a hot topic and as you can see, uh, there was a, a strong evidence uh, that was uh, presented um, uh, in the osteotomy uh, presentation and uh, let us see how we're going to do our uni. Uh, the objective of this talk first is we're going to talk about indications and criteria for unicompartmental replacement, uh, the preoperative evaluation and planning, the surgical techniques, our Egyptian experience here, and advances in unicompartmental. Uh, also, we're going to review the literature, look at the outcome, and see how the revision of a unicompartmental into tooth and knee is different. Um, then just a discussion with question and answers at the end. So what is unicompartmental replacement? This is what we like to see as surgeons, a patient who has good, good function, better than knee replacement, who can sit on the floor, pray, he can bend his knee fully, he can even practice some sports, 
um, and feels that his knee is nearly normal. But can this be achieved? This is the question, is um, how to achieve a good unicompartmental replacement. It doesn't always work. Let us see. Here, first of all, is a criteria. And this is the number one reason for success is patient selection. So if you select the wrong patient, then definitely the results will not be good. So the, these criteria are set by Oxford. And Oxford here is a mobile bearing for the medial compartment. And these criteria will fit for others, uh, but they are more specific for the mobile bearing Oxford. The criteria are based on x-ray here, but you will see we will give a touch on clinical. I mean, you're having a patient who has good knee pain and uh, this knee pain is pointing on the medial side specifically. And also he has good um, um, the indications for surgery. So he failed the conservative treatment and then he may not fit for osteotomy or a total knee. And then we'll see if he's going to fit for the uni or not. So the first criteria, as you can see here, based on that x-ray on anteroposterior and also lateral we'll see first is uh, um, as you can see um, uh, uh, that the medial has to be bone in bone so the top one they are okay they are fitting the criteria because they are bone in bone okay so and on, on the one on the far right side i mean with that bone in bone and even some bone lot you cannot do osteotomy here right and then the bottom one there when there is a preserved joint space this is not indicated for uni. You cannot do uni here and here, maybe it's a good option for uh, osteotomy. This one is a bit tricky and subtle. If you look at this X-ray carefully, you will see that is a lateral view. We are here assessing the function of the ECL. So this is not through an MRI, this is through an X-ray where uh, if the ECL is lost, then this is going to be the bottom one, which is contraindicated. So for the, especially for the Oxford, you need to have an intact and functioning ECL and no instability. When the ECL is lost, you will see that the femur is subluxed posteriorly and the erosion is posterior. So the erosion here is more into the posterior, as you can see here from the arrow, okay? But when the ECL is intact, then there is no subluxation and the erosion is anterior. And that's why it's called anteromedial osteoarthritis. So this is the indication, anteromedial osteoarthritis. So on the anterior also, uh, you will see it uh, on the medial side, which gives better results than the lateral. There are lateral compart unicompartmental, but in this talk, basically we are focusing on the medial compartment uh, osteoarthritis and the unicompartmental uh, replacement. The second, the, the third criteria here uh, is that you must have an intact lateral compartment. So when you do an X-ray, as you can see the two one on the left side, the lateral compartment is intact. On the right side, you can see lateral ossifies. These lateral ossifies, many might think that uh, this is a contraindication because this is an osteoarthritis in the lateral. Actually, lateral ossified is not a contraindication as long as the cartilage is good and also um, the joint space is preserved. How do you know the cartilage is good? You will note either that in investigation like MRI and also intraoperatively, you have to look at two things, ECL that's intact and functioning well, and also that the lateral compartment is intact. The bottom one, as you can see here, with the lateral compartment narrowed, that is not indicated for Yoni. Correctability. Correctability here, you examine the patient clinically. So at 20, 30 degree of flexion to relax the posterior capsule, and then you do a stress, a valgus stress, and see uh, if it is correctable or not. So a patient has got 10 degree, 15 degree varus. If it is not correctable, this is again not indicated for Yoni, all right? And as you can see here, the bottom one on the X-ray, when you do the valgus stress X-ray, then you will see that uh, there is no opening on the medial. The patellofemoral is very important. Patellofemoral arthritis is not contraindication. However, if you have, as, as you see on the bottom slide, that the arthritis is severe on the lateral compartment and you can see subluxation and bone loss, this is contraindicated. But the, the, the top one, all the x-rays are indicated. You can see that there is a medial osteoarthritis in the medial facet or on the lateral facet, but slight, as you can see here, and the tracking is good, this is indicated. So how about surgical techniques? Okay, 
we have here four surgical techniques and we have to go quickly because this is a very long talk uh, we have a fixed bearing we have a mobile bearing and we can do also patient specific instrument or we can do others like robotics and navigation so for we'll start first with a fixed bearing if you look at this model here okay so what we have is a medial compartment osteoarthritis replaced by a uh, uh, uni compartmental replacement here is the femoral component so we have to prepare the femoral part to fit the femoral component and then you have also to prepare the tibia in order to take um, a tibial component which you can see here it is two parts one is a metal base blade okay and this will fit here and this is a plastic and this plastic here is fixed so it goes exactly like when you do two tenier replacement so it's a breast fit and once it fits there it is a fixed bearing uh, medial yoni the mobile bearing one you will have the polyethylene rotating freely so it's not fixed to the metallic uh, part so basically this is a, a uni compartmental uh, knee replacement and we'll see uh, at one of the techniques here for um, fixed bearing i have to run this video uh, fast um, just for the sake of time so you have a medial compartment osteoarthritis and you need to prepare the femoral component in order to receive the part and also prepare the tibial component so starting tibia first for tibia here you must understand that you cannot do a tibia intramedullary it has to be extramedullary as you can see here so that's an extramedullary jag like when you do a uh, total knee replacement but that's based on the medial aspect and you um, get the jig fixed and then you measure with a stylus like what you normally do with a knee replacement what is different from knee replacement here is that you do a vertical cut just to separate the lat the medial compartment from the rest of the knee or the lateral compartment so be careful that you don't um, compromise the ecl insertion so you are just beside the ecl insertion here and that's the tibia is removed and then you can measure uh, the gap and I will quickly run this and then you go for the femoral preparation there are different ways here with the femur you have the option is either to go intramedullary or extramedullary and that depends on the company some implants they have both uh, intra and extramedullary and some like Oxford the Oxford now they have only intramedullary okay so you are here cutting the femur distally and then you will have a posterior cut with a distal cut this is fixed for all types of uni compartmental replacement you must have a distal cut and a posterior cut but the chamfer cuts that depends also on the technique fixed bearing or mobile bearing like for muscle fixed bearing you will have a one chamfer cut uh, for mobile bearing you wouldn't have a chamfer cut uh, but you will have because there is a male that that, that prepared the distal femur for you but what is standard here as you can see here the distal cut and the posterior cut and these two creates for you the flexion and extension gap so what's critical here about the compartmental replacement is to make sure that the flexion and extension gap are um, equalized So you can see here you're fitting the femoral component uh, doing the chamfer cut and doing the lug holes and then just putting the femur and that's it that's your uni compartmental replacement right and that's done okay so let's do some case discussions I have few cases here for you um, this is a patient which was done in uh, 2007 presented first with um, the right knee uh, pain although the left knee was worse but the pain was mainly on the right side and medial and this is not uncommon that patient present with pain on the uh, more healthier side 
and as a result she was a candidate for unicompartmental replacement and she was fitting the criteria actually she needs bilateral but this is was her complaint so basically we did the unicompartmental replacement it is surviving now from 2007 is about 13 years and it's doing well a year later she came with a pain on the other side the left knee which um, was not fitting the criteria for unicompartmental and also was not fitting the criteria at the time of presentation when she had her right knee so she had that total knee replacement on that side and what surprised me is that this patient post-operatively she was happier with the unicompartmental and had good function um, and this was a good case example where a patient had a uni and a total and was always satisfied with the uni and as i mentioned this is not always the case it's a difficult procedure is very demanding and if it is not done well then you may uh, not get the function that you require uh, this case here as you can see here as a year later a patient who came 81 and 81 i never thought that a patient like this will fit criteria for unicompartmental replacement but he was quite fit he was a slim tall which um, and this is a good candidate for unicompartmental replacement he was somehow sporty he used to walk for about two miles a day and he had this pain and that's limited his mobility and also uh, limited his um, um, religious and social habits because he was very keen on praying and sitting on the ground and uh, that's why he was a good candidate for yoni uh, the pain was pointed medially he has a bilateral symmetrical x-ray i'm sorry i don't have the other x-ray uh, but they are bilateral symmetrical and he has got a uh, full range of motion even with this arthritis and this was surprising uh, if you do a knee replacement he would lose some of this range of motion um, so there was no uh, deformity and this was correctable and stable and intact uh, acl so i have some questions to you uh, just to see uh, your thinking so the first question here is um so i can't see this what, do you recommend any more uh, radiology like uh do you recommend um more x-rays or uh, as you can see here a skyline view for a patella vargas virus and uh or a CT scanner mri or all of the above So please let me know your answers. Uh, you, you will have a button there with a poll to choose. You can use the mouse and choose whatever you like. So here are the results. Uh, oh, the majority all of the above. Okay, that's fine. So the second question is, what's your um, plan of management? Are you going to do an injection of the knee here? Or are you going to do a steotomy? You're going to do unicompartmental replacement or a total knee replacement. So which one are you going to do? And it looks like, um, can we get the answer for this one? No. Then a second one, plan of management, that's it. Yeah, so there is a variation here. Some will continue conservative treatment. Some will do a unicompartmental replacement. Okay. And the third question is, um, for arthroplasty what is your preferred uh, procedure are you going to do uh, unicompartmental on one side or are you going to do bilateral simultaneous unicompartmental you're going to do total knee on one side you're going to do um, bilateral knee simultaneous or are you going to do one side uni and one side uh, tkr and as i said they are bilateral symmetrical uh, on, on the x-ray so with the answers here is again there are variation, but the majority will do a unicompartmental replacement, um, whether uh, unilateral or bilateral simultaneous. The next question is, if you do a unicompartmental knee, what is your preferred technique? Are you going to use conventional instruments, navigation, robotics, patient-specific, or others? So the majority here will use conventional um, and instruments, and some will use uh, patient-specific and then uh, robotics and um, one more question about the type of implant so what are we going to use are you going to use a fixed bearing with intramedullary or fixed bearing with extramedullary are you going to use mobile bearing um, Oxford uh, here I'm saying extramedullary or intramedullary 
or the last one is patient specific so some of you selected um, mobile bearing oxford using an uh, extra medallion and this is not available okay so this was a tricky question i mentioned it during the technique but this is not available so this option should not be there but all other options um, are um, uh, accepted okay and my last question to you is about how about uh, the post-operative plan for unicompartmental replacement so you you did for this patient um unicompartmental replacement whether unilateral or bilateral are you going to do full with bearing um, after um, a few hours from surgery? Uh, would you discharge the patient after two days? Are you going to allow full range of motion? Or, and can this patient pray normally and sit on the floor or all of the above? So here I can see variation uh, on, in the answer. Uh, very few who will discharge the patient after two days or uh, say that this patient can uh, pray. Um, there's no right or wrong answer. It all depends on um, your views and what you're going to, to do with your unicompartmental replacement. But for me, is all of the above. Okay. And let us see what has been done for this patient. So this patient had the bilateral simultaneous and this was my option for him. He was fit and well. He had just a mild hypertension, which is expected for his age, but did not have any other uh, comorbidities. And he was fit and well. And as you can see here, bilateral uh, uh, unique compartmental replacement and you can see the function here this is only two hours after surgery where the patient is sitting on the chair and extending his knee you can see some blood there uh, because i don't use drains and you can see also the flexion uh, a patient like this do you think that osteotomy for one side or two sides will fit a patient who's 80 year old um, i think any compartmental will allow him to walk straight away and uh, decrease any uh, problem with rehabilitation or comorbidities um 2013 we had uh, um, a problem with uh, fixed bearing uh, knee replacement that we had in egypt here and there was a um, uh, number of only implants available not complete stock and and then i had um, this patient here who's 70 year old who had a, a bullet in his um, knee and he has complaining of medial compartment uh, osteoarthritis. You can see the anthroposterior view here. This one is a scanogram for a CT scan because we did a patient specific. So this, was not, this is not the uh, standing long leg film. Uh, with a standing long leg film, it was not done, but with a standing leg X-ray, uh, the regular one, uh, the deformity was more than 10 degree. Um, and this was his criteria, was fitting the criteria for Yoni. And we did the Yoni compartmental replacement for him using um, um, a patient specific uh, an instrumentation and as you can see here based on CT scan you can see the the drawings here uh, and the measurements for the sizing and you also can assess the bone quality and everything as you can see here and this is another view and you can see here the ossifies and it was very critical that you make the jags so that you can make the cuts. This is on the femur and this is on the tibia intraoperatively. Um, so that you can, when you do the cuts and you, when you position the femoral component, especially with the lug, um, as you can see here, the pigs are not touching the bullet. They are just, they are an overlay, but it is not, not touching because we were worried also about any infection. Mobile bearing technique uh, with the L experience. Um, this was uh, in UK, uh, but recently in Egypt here in the late 2017, we had the mobile bearing, and this is the only one available here uh, in Egypt uh, right now. And this is a video for the surgical technique for uh, the Yoni compartmental replacement using mobile bearing. Uh, again, I'm just going to speed this video. Um, so here with the mobile bearing, the technique is a bit different. Um, for, I mean, for the tibia is like any um, other techniques where you only make one cut transverse and one cut vertical to remove uh, that part from the medial uh, compartment. So this is uh, straightforward, as you can see here, and we saw it in the previous video. And then you, very important to protect the medial ligament during uh, this cut, otherwise you can cut the medial ligament, you'll be in trouble. Um, and then the preparation for the femur here with the mobile bearing Oxford is really different. It has to be intramedullary. 
and for me i think this is just a bit of a disadvantage having intramedullary uh, you have to do retraction uh, and expose the intracondylar area and then once you do two pigs you position the rest of the instrument and you do the preparation um, and you will see that the preparation here for the femur is by milling so it is not like uh, one cut the cut is only in the distal uh, sorry in the posterior but the distal cut is by uh, milling and then this is just the rest of the finishing but once this is done you position your implant and this is the end of the procedure okay so let us see how this looks like uh we're on 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 the model here so again we we mentioned about uh the femoral part and the tibial part with a fixed bearing or mobile bearing is very important that you need to have the intact medial ligament and make sure that your thickness of polyethylene is perfect because if you imagine here that the thickness of polyethylene is more than it should be then what's going to happen that's going to be like this okay so it's going to go into valgus right and if the polyethylene is less then it's going to go into varus so what's critical here is to make sure that the polyethylene thickness is exact that's different from knee replacement because with a total knee replacement you have you have the polyethylene it does not affect your mediolateral or valgus varus uh, alignment but for the yoni here it does um, also what's different for yoni from total is that you don't do soft tissue release for a total knee we do soft tissue release that's why you have to have correctable deformity because if it is not correctable then you cannot do soft tissue release in this procedure um, here is um, a technique from one of the companies where they have the mobile bearing uh, but by patient specific and the patient specific uh, technique will help you that you don't have to go into ramidalari uh, because you position the jig and then you do the preparation for the femur without going to the uh, intramedullary uh, canal and also we have um, a technique here in egypt with a patient specific with a with a mobile uh, bearing uh, oxford so this is a left knee here and this is a medial compartment and what you have here is a jig for the tibia where you can position it uh, on the tibia like this and then fix it by pins and it based is on ct scan so once you put it there after removing any cartilage or soft tissue in this area and then you position it and it it is well fixed and then you just put the pins and make your cut transverse and the vertical the vertical cut here and this is the beauty of this one is that the vertical cut is already planned preoperatively when you do the conventional technique this vertical cut is eyeballing so it just depends on the surgeon how he looked at um, the landmarks you need to look at the anterior superior like spine and it's really difficult to uh, position your transverse uh, uh, sorry your vertical cut here and this is for the femur um, again that is fitting on on the shape of the bone you have to remove any remaining cartilage usually there is no cartilage here but after you remove the remaining cartilage and then you position it and then it fits again into one position and as a result you can do the two drills here once you remove this one you can just put the conventional jig and do the milling here and then the procedure is finished without going into the intra uh, medullary uh, canal uh, robotics as you can see here this is a big robot industrial robot and it can do unicompartmental replacement and this one now it's getting more popularized especially in us um, and some european countries and also in the gulf area and uh, with this robotic technique definitely there is higher accuracy but there is um, high cost and cost effectiveness is not proved yet uh, handheld robot is just a robot that you can hold in your hand and again you can do the unicompartmental replacement with this handheld robot but again um, this is not uh, proven as a cost effective but it's much easier than using industrial robot 
the literature there is no time to review all of the literature here but i have um, some examples here where the showing um, this paper from the knee in 2011 uh, showing that the clinical outcome after revision surgery was inferior to that of primary tke here we are talking specifically about a failed unicompartmental that is going to go for a knee replacement so the clinical outcome is less favorable okay and um and there is a systemic review here and um, as you can see a large number of patients uh, with many studies um, and if you look at the studies here listed in so many journals there are more than 20 studies here uh, with, with 20,000 plus uh, number of patients and this is the summary variation in the literature with regards to the revision after uni compartmental replacement uh, so if you convert uni to a total then this is a, this is a problem that you don't get um, a good function as when you do a, a primary to knee replacement and the likelihood that you will require augmented prosthesis so you may require augment you may require revision implants so be prepared um, however still the outcome is better than revising a failed to knee replacement so when a knee and you revise it then outcome is worse uh, here i'm presenting two cases quickly uh, one is a patient who is 48 who had um, a right unicompartmental replacement by another surgeon who is an experienced surgeon he did a very good job and um, this uh, unicompartmental replacement lasts for uh, nine years so it was really good and um, considering that it was done after a fracture but he came with uh, development of arthritis on the other on the other compartments um, and also um, a pain and he was fitting um, criteria for a revision um, knee replacement um, unfortunately i don't have the preoperative x-ray but i have the operative one um, and as you can see here this is some um, remarks on his, on on during surgery this is a message to you this is the revision when we did the revision although i, do, I had a revision implant standby uh, i didn't require a revision implant he had good ligaments uh, however uh, as you can see here the polyethylene uh, is thick and you can see that metal bar there this which means that it is a polyethylene is more than 17 and that's with a high polyethylene you need to be very careful right um and and that's what we did for the case afterwards is that uh, we found that using um, computer assisted techniques could be very useful so i had a patient here um, this is not from egypt this is a patient who was from um, um, one of the countries in africa and i had to um, travel there i was doing a few cases and this is the criteria for this patient um, you can see here he had a yoni which survived it for 15 years and then it failed and became completely uh, loose um, this was his um, yoni Uh, and this was the planning during the surgery uh, as you can see here how um, big is the gap and with the patient specific the, the advantage here is that i can um, control the amount of bone that's going to be removed so i can minimize the bone that's going to be re uh, removed and in this case we don't have to uh, use um, uh, revision implants or uh, to use a, a thicker polyethylene you can see here the planning and this is the position of the jug uh, that's all on the computer before the surgeon and you can see here the polyethylene you can see how the polyethylene is aligned um, that's again all the planning that's during surgery you can see I am doing the femoral cut I removed the femoral implant here is the polyethylene still there with the with the tibia and I positioned the template the jig and I did the cut you can see here and that is after making the cut on the femur I was able to uh, remove the polyethylene uh, it was a bit difficult to remove it to start with and then you can see the tibial base blade is still there and here is a planning you can plan it to do it after removal of the tibial base blade or you can position the jig on the tibial base blade you can have the two options and this is the position and as you can see here um, completing the surgery this is post operatively i mean this patient post operatively he had the knee replacement you can see the gap here is really very small that's probably 10 millimeter so okay so rather than going for a more than 17 polyethylene and require a revision implant or a stem then here you don't require that 
uh, with the patient specific so the conclusion of my talk and this is my last slide here that unicompartmental is more anatomical more physiological and it is supposed to have a good function for the patient the variation in the literature with the revision rates after unicompartmental um, is that uni is likely to need uh, revision sooner than than tke however the Oxford studies share with that the results of the unicompartmental replacement is as good as knee replacement and even better with more than 20 years survival. The function here is not as good as having um, um, a, um, a primary TKA that's after revision and there is a likelihood of augmented processes. Uh, however, it is better than having a revision for TKA. So in conclusion, um, I recommend unicompartmental replacement for selected patient and my feeling is just to make a compromise and also uh, to be a friend with uh, Professor Gamal Hosni as that I want to say that there is no competition between uni and osteotomy. There are patients who fit well for uni, there are patients who fit well for osteotomy and very few patients who are really uh, between the two depends on the surgeon's uh, preference. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mahmoud. Oh, actually, there is no competition <laughs> because osteotomy is the winner. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm your guest today, so I have to agree. All right. <laughs> okay. I think the first question for me, why uh, good range of motion is a prerequisite uh, for, osteo for, uh, for osteotomy? Uh, this is very important because, yes, because if you have a stiff knee, actually you are not going to um, uh, improve, you are not going to do the offload uh, during movement. So a uh, fair range of motion is an essential part of the, uh, of the uh, doing osteotomy. Uh, can you describe the fibula, um, describe fibula distal migration for uh, lateral ligament laxity? Yeah, okay. Uh, if we have a, uh, uh, that ligamentous laxity, severe ligamentous laxity, which is difficult to treat, actually. And it's a long-standing uh, uh, one, especially in such a patient. The patient is doing heavy work. He has to stand perhaps 10 hours per day or something. He has to squat. Uh, we thought about removing a piece of the fibula. It's about three centimeters. And we isolate the frame. We have a part of the frame which corrects the, me the major deformity of the knee. And then we put a half ring, which is attached to the fibula through half pins and wires. And we pull the proximal part, one millimeter per day. When we pull the proximal part, you know, the collateral, lateral collateral ligament is fixed to the head of the fibula. When we put it, we pull the lateral ligament down. And so we tighten the lateral ligament. And we had a clinical... Uh, experiments with the patients. We ask the patient to do full weight bearing and to ask the patient to stand on one leg, on this leg, and to see the thrust. If there is no thrust, we stop. And um, sometimes we allow the patient to judge it to walk for two or three weeks, not just one or two days, because it takes some time for the patient to do full weight bearing, to judge it. Then we close, when we close the gap, we do compression. Uh, aiming for the union, but actually we don't aim for complete union of the fibula for such a for in such a situation, because even if you have non-union, usually there is fibrous uh, union, and mm. the displacement of the fibula is about two or three millimeters, and it does not cause any problem because we have moved the fibula down for about two and a half centimeters, which is uh, fair enough. 
It's a simple procedure because if we use the segment in the junction between the distal and the middle two thirds of the fibula, which is very safe. Uh, people may think that when you push the head of the fibula, perhaps the common pronial, you have a common pronial problem or something. We thought, that, we thought uh, so at the beginning and we were very careful because we, do one, we did it one millimeter per day and we asked the patient about numbers, but nothing happened actually in all the patients. And we repeated the procedure, repeated the procedure, and there was no problem with the uh, common pronial. Uh, this is the explanation of this part of the segment. I think the next question for Dr. Uh, Mahmoud. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, what about the shape of the right tibial compartment of the patient with uh, by uni uh, eight years? So. Oh, the, he's talking about the, the slope of the uh, tibial compartment for that patient. Um, I can't remember um, how how much in degrees, but I think it was just um it was not it's not it's not that bad i mean from the lateral x-ray um as i can look at it let me have a chance to look at the x-ray now his slope was normal was within normal um i mean the slope for unicompartmental replacement if you're doing an oxford unicompartmental the posterior slope is fixed at seven degrees so you don't have options here you follow the jags it cuts seven degrees and that's it for other um, uh, implants you just need to follow what the recommendation of the implant company whether you know like what you do knee replacement so the for the slope it has to be less than 10 degrees um, anyhow uh, the second question I think for me professor Gamal can you describe uh, this stuff here? yes we finished it uh, yeah. Is fibular osteotomy mandatory with high tibial osteotomy? Yes, I think so. I think fibular osteotomy is mandatory for high tibial osteotomy, especially if you want to correct. Uh, if we speak about a deformity, we are, we are correcting a deformity. And in many cases, after evaluation of the patient, you know, our work is different from the literature because in the literature, they deal with the um, unicompartmental osteoarthritis and various deformity as a coronal plane deformity and uh, it's, uh, as a simple thing and you just push it in the coronal plane. For us we treat each patient separately and each patient has its, its, uh, his own merit. In some patients we have rotational deformity and we correct it so we need also fibular osteotomy in some patients we has an oblique plane deformity we corrected the deformity in the oblique plane and uh, that's why i think fibular deformity fibular osteotomy is mandatory in such cases okay Prof. gamal i have a question to you yes you know it's uh, not uncommon um in egypt here and many other countries you get surgeons who do osteotomy um for patients who has good bone and bone and even bone erosion um, so what do you think of this? You know, um, I mean, osteotomy, uh, like a medial compartment where the bone is completely, uh, the joint space is completely lost and there is even some like erosion of the bone. So if you do osteotomy and you correct the alignment, then the arthritis is still there and the pain is still there. So w w what do you think? This is a very important question. This entity, if you have a real lesion, if you have a real lesion, confined lesion, with unicompartmental uh, uh, osteoarthritis. You have, um, perhaps you have an ulcer, you have an ulcer, wh whatever the, the reason. You can combine high tibial osteotomy with other procedures. You can do abrasion, you can do mosaicplasty, you can do uh, PRB, you can do uh, stem cells, stem cells. <laughs> Uh, but I'm talking about generalized osteoarthritis, you know, like the whole femoral compartment, the whole tibial, um, you know, uh, plateau um, is no cartilage at all, like bone on bone, and even some bone is eroded. So in this case, I mean, any other procedures will not will not fit. So you correct the alignment, so it looks like a cosmetic correction, but the the pain from that arthritis will will be there. Um, I, I'm not sure what the, I mean for me I will say this patient should be uh, unicompartmental or total um, but 
if he if he do osteotomy for this patient i'm sure that the pain will be relieved the alignment will be better the progression of arthritis will decrease uh, but it is not um definitive procedure is not a procedure that is going to last long so what do you think i think you speak about the end stage of yes arthritis. absolutely end stage. yes the end stage also arthritis is not an indication for high table osteotomy okay this is an end stage and uh, you know, it's not only an X-ray um, finding, the pain, the pain which awakens the patient at night. Yeah. This is the, the real uh, indication for arthroplasty. So it's not just because <laughs> evaluating the patient with X-rays is, is very misleading in mm. my experience. Because uh, especially in osteoarthritis, sometimes you have severe osteoarthritis. So it's stage four or something, whatever the type of classification you use. And you have minimal pain. Mm. And in other cases, you have moderate arthritis and severe pain, which awakens the patient at yes. night. So sometimes it's very difficult to say that um, the patient has lost all his cartilage from the plain X-ray. So I mm. prefer I prefer the pain. The pain, uh, okay. the pain. I think it's. I, I want to ask you more also about this. The pain is more indicative of this problem. Pain at night, the pain which, you know, the patient cannot live, cannot live this way anymore. Yes. I think this is more predictor of the problem yeah. of the cartilage. What would you think, Mahmoud? Yeah, of course. I mean, we the, the traditional teaching in, in UK when they say what's the indication for arthroplasty, you know, like especially for um, um, hip arthroplasty, you say, okay, you need to have the number one indication is pain. Number two indication is pain up till 10. Pain, 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 pain. So it's definitely the patient symptoms especially the pain is number one um, but the problem with the pain is that um, is pain threshold is different between different patients and also there are patients who are exaggerating pain and uh, um, and also there is another phenomena which i have um, um, seen significant here in egypt that the patient comes with like bilateral knee osteoarthritis always complain of the healthier side uh, for more pain so the one side which is affected more, okay, is not complaining off. So sometimes based on what you see also with the x-ray on occasional cases, that if you ignore the, uh, the other side which has less pain but has got severe deformity or going to go into progression that you cannot salvage with surgery, then in this case you may go for surgery for the less painful one. But this is exceptional uh, situations. Um, if you don't have questions, I have a philosophical question uh, for you about, um, you know, with deformity, young patients who have got uh, bowing of the legs or have got virus and they live with it, you know, like you see patients like at the age of 80 and 90 and they don't have osteoarthritis and um, you are the expert in deformity correction. So how, you know, like when we have knee replacement, we cannot... Uh, leave a patient with like severe varus or severe vulgus because this will definitely go into into failure although there is recently in the literature now there's something called constitutional varus that you have to leave some degree of varus with the knee plane because we used to have like a zero degree um you know on the coronal plane that there is no deviation at all no deformity you have to have it completely you know normally aligned um but the literature, the old literature said that you can uh, allow up to three degree of deviation, three degree varus or three degree vulgus. Recently now, they're going for more than three degree because it was what's called constitutional varus. But you get patients who are living normally with more than 10 degree or 15 degree with, vera, with varus and bowing of the legs and they live for the whole of their life without arthritis. So why this normal joint survive longer but the artificial joint cannot tolerate that malalignment. Uh, I would like to confuse you more. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Two important points. Here in Egypt, if you um, make a survey for the basketball players and the football players, you know, I was playing basketball before, not less than 30% of the players, they have significant various deformity. Okay. And they are champions. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to mention names. All right. But I want you to just look to have a, on the players before and then the current players and see there is a good percentage of players right. in different um, 
uh, in different uh, types of sports, especially in football, because the people, they like football yes. and basketball or something. You see, many of them, they had various deformity. The second fact is uh, the range of various, you know, when we measure the mechanical axis, we usually have, um, you know, a range. Yes. We look to the various range, it's far than the vulgus range. Mm. Which is exactly what you say. Yes. We have many people of physiological uh, varus because the varus range is mm. maybe something like 8 or 10 degrees. Right. If you have the patient Correct. up to 8 degrees mm. in varus, is normal, within the normal range. Right. How we decide normal and abnormal? Just the statistics. That's we don't thing. know. We don't yes. know for sure. And this is the real problem for the prosthesis. Mm. When you do prosthesis, you correct the mechanical axis or something. But the people forget that the norm, the mechanical axis, we, we created the mechani axis, mechanical axis, we know. And we think that the mechanical axis has to be from this point to this point. Correct. This is our imagination. It's exactly like um, saying uh, this is a two plane deformity. We have a coronal plane deformity and sagittal plane. This is not true. That's artificial. This is artificial. Yeah. We because, developed to because the body is a 3D. Uh, yes. AP yeah. and lateral. And we judge everybody by AP and lateral. But actually the body is not AP and lateral. We want to uh, measure everything with the, th with the things which we yes. uh, developed. And this is, uh, this is not true. This is yes. the, uh, the real problem that yeah. we usually imagine. We put the rule and we want to apply our rules to... Uh, uh, everything we think the rules is a complete truth you know yeah, well, which is it's not, a, it, which is i mean true. i always hear what we you are say just researchers what you're saying about oblique plane deformity so it's not yeah. just like an ap and lateral it could be oblique at many different degrees uh, exactly 20 30 40 50 whatever you know and after doing thousands of cases most of the cases are oblique plane deformities yes they are not pur purely sagittal or uh, right. Corona. This is not true. Yeah, that's why so you require patient specific based on 3D planning. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Specific. And I think now okay. the next step in the science that yeah. all the deformities will be measured on the 3D uh, uh, basis, right. not AP Absolutely. and lateral. Absolutely. And we'll find later, uh, very soon, yes. that the CT in the operating theater is a 3D one. Absolutely. It will give you the 3D uh, picture. I think that's this a, that's is the future. This is the real future. Of yes. the, 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 the question also about, you know, this deformity in normal individuals, when you say that you can have eight degrees normal or 10 degrees, if a patient has got 10 degrees, then the load on the medial compartment is different from the lateral compartment. So it's not going to be 50, 50 or 60, 40. There's going to be like a massive load on the, like, for example, if it's a virus, it's going to be in the medial compartment. So how do you explain that these patients are champions in sports and they, they stay, you know, like age 80, 90 and without even having joint replacement, without having even arthritis? Because we see them. The load is different. Yeah. Yes, be, well, because we see, we see them in the, um, during the, the, the period of uh, very high activity. Mm. You know, the people can tolerate deformities for such a long time, especially in patients and mm. children. Right. When we judge children, children with hip dysplasia or deformities, and the people, they always think about the follow-up by x-rays and clinical follow-up. Mm. And we always say the clinical follow-up in children is not that important yes. because they tolerate the deformity. Yes. They don't have pain. It is from so, God, so that yeah, the, so it is, it is <laughs> designed, designed this way. But once these patients, you know, like look, if, if they get accident and they get more virus or vulgus, exactly. then they deteriorate. And ask about the age 50 and 60. Yes. How far they are going during that, uh, this age? That's What's correct. the activity yes. of, this, of, the, of those players at the age 60 years or something like yes, this? Absolutely. If they have this severe, uh, severe deformity. And I've yeah. seen that myself. Yes. You know, at this age, you have severe, severe uh, osteoarthritis. No. That's a very good discussion. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. we don't have uh, statistics yes. to prove because we cannot leave the patients. Uh, it's not ethical to leave the patient with a, with a deformity, you yes. know, till the age 60 to see it's going to be a terrible situation or not. So That's it's good. very difficult to get valid statistics from this comparison. As a future. Uh, I think the question for you, what do you mean by offload? 
دكتور محمود سو كويستشنز ام اوف لود وات ذا ريست اوف ذا كويستشن ذا مينينج اوف اوف لود فيري شورت كويستشنز اي لايك فيري شورت كويستشنز كيت هي ريكوير شورت انسر يس It's just from the from the name offloading. So you offload the 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 the, the load on the joints. Uh, it just it depends on the context. You have to complete the question. Offloading for what? Yeah. But if you, if you, if you just looking at the name, you can just look at the dictionary. So, but uh, again, questions about the fibular osteotomy. I think I s- I stimulated the, most of the audience by the fibular osteotomy case. Uh, One question is about the fibular osteotomy. There is a paper coming from India about uh, doing just fibular osteotomy and they claim good results. Actually, we have no experience by doing just fibular osteotomy. And uh, we don't have this. And, you know, occasional papers, you you know, I don't advise you to repeat just a result came from an occasional paper. Yes, exactly. Exactly like when somebody will tell you, okay, I mean, here is, uh, this drug is magic. You can just use this gel or ointment and you can, you see the adverts in the television, you know, see this gel and then it's going to be great. Yes, it will definitely help. It will relieve the pain for some patients, not for all patients. And that is, could be marginal benefit, but you don't consider this as, as a cure. A uh, question for you, it's a, it's a good pre- uh, range of motion, is a prerequisite for uni compartmental Yeah, that's, that's a good process. question, yes. Yeah. I mean, for um, t- before doing uni or total, uh, the range of motion before surgery will uh, indicate how much is going to be after surgery. So you have good range preoperatively, then you will have good range also uh, postoperatively. That's why patients here, when they present very late after arthritis, the results are not that good because they lost part of range of motion, just muscle power and other things. For, for uni compartmental, uh, yes, definitely. I mean, if you got a patient with um, a range of motion very limited with, or with flexion deformity, then this is a contraindication, okay? So you need to have a patient with a good, reasonable range of motion so that he can improve it more, okay? Uh, but be careful that some limitation of flexion is just pain in pain inhibited because of the pain so once this patient is under anesthesia so maybe he can bend up to 80 and then he will scream of pain but if they take them under anesthesia then you can get full flexion of this patient so you need when you test the range of motion you need to eliminate uh, the, the the pain inhibition factor okay you need to make sure that is the fixed deformity or not so if you have a flexion deformity of 30, 30 degree and as a fixed deformity this is definitely contraindication for uh, for yoni So I think if, if there's severe limitation of motion, Dr. Mahmoud, it's, uh, it's an indication for knee arthroplasty, normal. Yeah, I mean, for, for knee replacement, you will get 120 degree of flexion or, or maybe more, okay? But you have the advantage here of doing a lot of soft tissue release uh, and working on the two compartments, so you may be able to. We get patients who are fused knee. Fused knees, there is no, whether it is a surgical fusion or whether it is um, pathological or whatever. Um, and with this fusion, we, we convert them into total knee replacement and we get good range of motion. But these patients, you cannot do unicompartment mm. because unicompartmental, no soft tissue release. It's just only a bony procedure. You only cuts and you cannot do any soft tissue release. That's why you have to have a correctable deformity. So every patient coming for uni, we examine them clinically at 20 degrees, 30 degree of flexion to release the posterior capsule and then try to correct that verse and see it opens or not. If it does not open, it means it is not correctable deformity. You cannot do uni. And that's why I'm saying that, that, that the competition between uni and osteotomy is not as many people think. No, no, there are patients who are really fitting well for osteotomy. There are patients who are fitting well for uh, uni. Um, I would like to ask also a question. If the patient, you know, we did osteotomy and everything was okay, but the arthritic changes did not improve or worsened. Yes. Does it make any difference when you do an arthroplasty afterwards? I mean, is it more difficult? Or yeah, most of the literature. I mean, technically? Because, you know, I mean, the theoretically, alignment is okay. Theoretically, it's more difficult because you have plates, you have screws, you have to remove them. 
uh, there could be risk of infection and and you know after removal of metal there is always no, we, risk we put external fixator oh, external no fixator is <laughs> <laughs> different a laser roof is different this is a magic laser roof <laughs> but you, when you have plates and screws and i i think we need a study to compare between tkr after osteotomy um but the osteotomy could be either the corrected by external fixator or laser off or corrected by plate and screws w uh, which are still there then i'm sure that the results will be different because removal of metal has good complications and also risk of infection the question for uh, for you what's uh, what's uh, what's better mobile or, or fixed, fixed bearing? bearing yeah yes Uni. for unicompartmental. compartmental if you look at the oxford results which comes from oxford university or oxford itself the, it is great and it is mobile bearing and they say is much better function than fixed bearing uh, survival more than 20 years so it, it, it is great but unfortunately these results are not reproducible so if you are an oxford or are expert in doing oxford i will say mobile bearing if you are not then do fixed bearing because fixed bearing is easier so it depends on the what uh, what's available for you for example in egypt now right now we don't we don't have fixed bearing we only have mobile bearing i use fixed bearing and shoot i showed few cases this was um 10 years and longer but but not now uh, so you now we don't have option but as i my conclusion if you don't if you have less experience do fixed bearing if you have more experience you can do mobile bearing and optimize the function okay the last question for me during fibula distal migration do you separate uh, the fibula proximally from the tibia no we don't uh, do another osteotomy we don't do mm -hmm. separation it's just we we are pulling down the head of the fibula and there is there is no problem almost with the this procedure and remember when we do lengthening for two centimeters or something we don't fix the proximal tibial fibula we allow soft movement of the proximal uh, tibial fibular uh, joint uh, um, finally, I would like to thank uh, Professor Mahmoud Hafiz for sharing me this uh, very fruitful uh, discussion. I would like to thank uh, uh, Adua Company for giving us the chance for uh, uh, giving uh, this presentation. Thank you. Bye.